basically, uh, we would like, to, would like to discuss with the current affair regarding to Hong Kong's electoral reform. Uh, maybe we can start with why is it necessary to improve Hong Kong's electoral system? I think what a lot of people fail to realize is, is how unstable the city of Hong Kong was from 2014 until 2019, you know, 2020. Um, you know, there, there's a really difficult period. You know, I was living in Hong Kong in 2014 uh, when the umbrella movement came, and that was a very peaceful protest. Um, but, you know, it, things started to really escalate, and that was obviously the, you know, the precursor to what was going to happen, you know, further down the line. And what we saw really, you know, with this last protest, um, this is just simply completely uncalled for. You know, for example, people People are saying, you know, we have to have democracy. It has to be our way. And, and we will resort to violence if we do not get that. And that's not part of a democracy. You know, we saw that in America, you know, unfortunately on January 6, where, you know, people said the same thing. I don't want this result. I'm going to do a riot. I'm going to resort to violence. And again, that is not acceptable in any form of society. The city of Hong Kong is Asia's world city. It's an incredible city. It's a very important part of China. And, you know, there has to be that guaranteed stability. And I think it's amazing how that stability was instantly given to the city of Hong Kong. You know, the national security law was implemented and, you know, now the city has been very peaceful. I agree with Angelo is, is you know, this democracy is constantly changing and needs improvements. And this was a very vital step. This is not the first time Hong Kong has electoral reform, nor will it be the last time. Hong Kong Electoral Committee started as a selection committee of 400. Then it was increased from 1998 to 800. Then it was increased to 1,200. Now they're talking about increasing to 1,500. This is just the keep on increasing of the electoral to be broadly representing uh, the Hong Kong people. Uh, whether this will solve all of the problem, I think Hong Kong is a complex society. This could be solving one of it, but it's not going to be one solution for all. So I think that this is just part of the ongoing process. So I think there's a recent research on the uh, the election reform, which is very interesting. I found it on this this morning. It's, it says uh, it's a uh, it's a four nation uh, peer research center survey conducted in November and December of 2020. It found that roughly two thirds of the adults in France and US, as well as half of the uh, half of those in the UK, believe their political system needs a major change. And uh, why do you think uh, people are not very happy with their uh, political um, um, system right now. What happens uh, in, in Europe and in the US, I think it's there's a pure hypocrisy to call them democracy. Uh, the EU is the, the, the least uh, democratic system. It's completely opaque and it's completely, it's been hijacked by the, 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 the corporate lobbies. So I think it's very important that uh, the West, they should look first at their own system and, and criticize their own system and improve their own system before trying to, to give lessons to either China or Hong Kong. When you look at China's uh, political system, there's 95% of satisfaction. So every, every place needs to find its own system that is, uh, that is good for, for itself. Probably the greatest advantage China's government has over other countries is the fact that they don't subject itself to this internal turmoil every four years. And this is something that we saw, you know, with the United States, a great example. I mean, Trump gets elected in 2016. He has a couple of years to start making some changes. Really in 2019, you know, he needs to shift and really focus on getting reelected. One of the great examples, you know, he started building a wall between, you know, Mexico and the United States. Now, whether you support that or, un or do not support that, um, what happened is, is he spent a lot of money on that wall and then Joe Biden came in and said, you know, we're, we're going to stop that. And so it's really hard to make a lot of progress. And this is why you see certain projects in America take decades to finish, you know, which should take just years to finish. This reform, I think, will give the, um, the legislative council, the chief executive more governable so that mm. Hong Kong can be more manageable. And the manageable is not about controlling the people. It's so that they can set up new processes for people to be more represented and people's benefit to be delivered to the, to the people. You know, I was in Hong Kong, see all of these demonstrations, ambulance cannot go to pick up old ladies to go to hospitals and all kinds of tragic things that happen. It's not for immediate, but for the longer term, so the government 
can be more governed better. So uh, it seems like every country needs to have their own democracy system. But it's uh, but 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 in a in Hong Kong situation, sort of. Uh, we have like a lot of pointing fingers from different countries to say, well, this is what you need to do. So how can we balance on that? You know, I think that with these new, you know, regulations, I think that it's going to really make sure that the one country, two systems is, you know, maintained and really respected and ensured for the future, you know, of the city. I think the other thing that's really important to realize is, is that, you know, Hong Kong was ranked number three on the human freedom index in the world. And again, this is after a period of over 20 years of having China, not the UK, as, you know, the, you know, the, the main source, or I should say, in charge of, of Hong Kong. You know, they didn't achieve that because of the relationship with Britain. After the SARS, China tried to help Hong Kong by sending tourists coming to Hong Kong every day. What do the Hong Kong people do? They complain, or the milk powder is bought up by the Chinese people, by the from, from mainland China. Hey, this is Hong Kong, you are a free port. If this month you're shortage of milk powder, why can't you buy in more next month? So mm. a lot of them, they only blaming people without understanding that China or Beijing is trying to help Hong Kong every turn of the way to make Hong Kong a better place. It seems that a lot of people have this uh, misconception in Hong Kong, especially this time uh, during the the, re uh, the electoral reform. There's a vetting committee, and uh, people are not very happy about it. And uh, what's your views on on the vetting committees, and why do we need them? Well, I, I think it's important to to uh, to uh, take note that in in Hong Kong, there's a, we saw there were petitions. Uh, in the street uh, where 3 million people signed for the national security law and another petition uh, that uh, got like 2.6 million signatures for the electoral reforms. So what, what happens in Hong Kong is that a lot of people, the silent majority is not much interested in politics, is very passive. And what is happening, what, what we get is, uh, is a minority, a radical minority that has been much more visible when those uh, people are, are talking about mutual destruction, I think it's extremely immature. And I think it's a process of educating people on what it means to have a democracy. The vetting committee is serious because uh, we have experienced, I think since 2016, many of the officials after they elected and they refused to take the oath of office. In the United States, from the president to the governor, to the senator, to the congressman, to the mayor, to the city councilman, everyone takes the oath of the office very seriously. So that is why it's so important to do certain type of vetting. I think vetting is an important part because I think, again, you're just going to have you know, more qualified people that are going to be responsible and that also have that same vision you know, for the future of the city. You know, you're looking at China, you know, China continues to move forward in one direction you know, because they have a very organized system, because they have a clear vision and a path on where they want to go. And another interesting point that we often hear in the Western media were uh, high, high autonomy of Hong Kong. Um, I spoke to some of the heavyweights in the pro-establishment camp in Hong Kong, and they actually explained about uh, the, the, um, the high autonomy is not a total independence. So um, what's your views on this? First of all, I always want to stress that Hong Kong SAR stands for Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, not self-autonomy region. And the complexity was Hong Kong was a colony for 100 years under mm -hmm. British rule. So in order to, to make these two sets of social system slowly come together, this transition period of 50 years, that being said does not mean 50 year plus one day, Hong Kong will totally change to a PRC mainland system. But mm -hmm. the hope is the two to come together, in, in, including currencies and everything else. But mm -hmm. uh, this is a transitional time. This is not a perpetual system that two, two places will be separate. The whole democracy of Hong Kong has been hijacked by foreign powers. And, and, and I would call them traitors also, you know, uh, uh, Hong Kong people, some Hong Kong people, they, uh, for X reasons, maybe a sense of superiority or other, other reasons, but they, they were willing to betray their motherland. 
And I think it's a shame. It's a shame. Uh, it's, and it's going to be a stain in the history of Hong Kong. Um, personally, I leave this as a, as a nightmare. Uh, as a foreigner uh, married to a, a mainland uh, Chinese uh, wife, uh, we, we were in danger. We felt in danger the whole time. And I, I personally feel angry with what happened. Uh, because what was behind this was not, that, that had nothing to do with freedom and democracy. It was a racist movement, and it, it was extremely violent. It was anti-democratic, and uh, I think they, they were behaving more like fascists than the democratic. But we need to go on, and we, be, we need to mend uh, the wounds of both sides, mm. uh, and we need to get together to save Hong Kong and, and to, to look for the future. A better future. One thing is, I, I think a lot of it is really a lack of knowledge, you know, from those that are kind of on the outside looking in. And let me give you an example. You know, a lot of people in the West have said, you know, look at the situation in Hong Kong. China's government is now taking away these freedoms. You know, they're not allowing, you know, a full and open election. And my response to that was always, and that's not something that they experienced when they were under British rule. For example, yeah. when, you know, when Britain was over in overseeing Hong Kong, you know, there was no elections at all, any form at all, you know, except Britain appointed the governor of Hong Kong. You know, people said, well, now look at the violence. Look at this Hong Kong police force. They're terrorists. And I said, again, the Hong Kong police force is one of the most reserved police forces. And they acted amazing, given yeah. you know, how much they were attacked. There was not <laughs> one single person, you know, a protester or rioter that was killed by a Hong Kong police. However, mm -hmm. in 1967, we saw, you know, in the riots, you know, British officers shot Hong Kong people. So there's just, you know, obviously time passes, people forget, people don't know the history. And so, again, we like to assume, oh, look at China, they're taking away all of these things from Hong Kong. Actually, China's given Hong Kong much more than Britain ever gave Hong Kong. And uh, it, it, it comes to a point that it seems that there's a habit of criticizing Hong Kong and criticizing China from the British government. It seems like they think that they have their rights to point fingers because uh, Hong Kong used to be their colonial cities. And, uh, it's, and, and it also seems like from, from my perspective that they're trying to hide from their incompetence inland. Uh, what's your views on, on that? I think that, you know, uh, certainly the colonial days, the Chinese were second class citizen. And those are really the days that we do remember. Uh, I do think that my friends and so forth, we have put a lot of blame on the foreign influence. Is there foreign influence? Of course there is foreign influence. But that in itself cannot be the excuse for the Hong Kong government just because there's foreign influence. They have to mm -hmm. counter that influence. Secondly is I do think the establishment of the national security law helped stabilize Hong Kong. I always say that if the traffic cops do not give out tickets, most people will be violating tra traffic rules, speedings and so forth, and a lot mm. of accidents will be happening. You do need to have rules in the society. Yes, uh, I, I agree with, uh, with Cyrus, what he said just before, uh, education is a big problem. I think there's a, a generation divide, if we, if we noticed, uh, uh, it was basically, uh, you had parents, a generation of uh, parents older in their 30s, 40s. Um, they had experienced uh, uh, Hong Kong under British rule. And you had the younger generation, we had no, which had no clue about the uh, history. Uh, they, they don't know, but uh, there was a, an ordinance called the Peak Ordinance, where Chinese could not go to the peak. Yeah. And yeah. so can you imagine if, what a shame for this generation, a shame for their parents and from for their, their ancestors uh, when they're waving uh, foreign flags. I mean, I, you you are hitting yourself on the foot. You can uh, you can watch Hollywood movies. You can uh, have Nike shoes, but at the end of the day, you you have roots and there is history, and you cannot deny this. You know when you have you know the Hong Kong youth, you know holding up British flags, and it's like you know or. American flags, please come and liberate us. You know, they just don't ha have any knowledge of the history. Um, you know, it wasn't the glory days for many Hong Kong people, you know, during the British occupation. And again, you know, if you really want to understand to go full circle, study the history. I think that many countries like the UK and the United States have voiced their support for the opposition in Hong Kong. And for those who want to support them, uh, please let them come to your country. 
Uh, the BNO, while it is supposed to be a, v a passport, it's really a glorified six-month extension visa. It does not allow you to have a social benefit. It does not treat you as a citizen. Of how many laws that the U.S. Congress uh, wrote last year, over 300 of them were against China. But how many of them they do it for the United States themselves? Only 100 about infrastructure, only 100 about health, and then 100 about education. So they wrote more laws to criticize China than to try to constructively do things for themselves. So anyway, uh, this is just irony. <laughs> So, so looking at uh, at this point of time, I think it's very critical for Hong Kong's future development. And uh, what what will be your prediction in ten years' time? Would this whole situation change? Uh, I personally think that there will be more uh, more investment from the mainland uh, mainland companies investing to Hong Kong. I mean. What, especially now that the situation is much, much more stable in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And again, what China wants for Hong Kong is actually to maintain the way it is, because it's a, uh, for China, it's important um, at the beginning, I think the idea of one country, two system was to be able to show Taiwan that the one country, two system could work. And, and, and I think it's very important. It's, it's a, a primordial objective for China to make sure that it's a successful experiment. I'm very optimistic. You know, like like I mentioned before, you know, I think the stock market's a great example of how you know it, it is so valuable because it, it gives you know mainland mainland investors an opportunity to you know be involved in international exchange. I think you know Hong Kong is always going to be a very desirable place to live. Um, it, it again, it's it's an incredible city. I think that you. I think this really does ensure that the future of the city is going to be maintained. And I know personally many friends that were, you know, celebrating with champagne bottles when the national security law was passed. I think, I think right now the stage is right, but it's up to the Hong Kong people, whether mm. Hong Kong people want to take advantage of this or not. And mm. I also want to say, do not underestimate the opposition. After Occupy Central, everybody say, oh, they go away, this is there. We... No, they're planning. They're planning for the next wave. So, yeah. you know, they're going to attend all of these seminars all over the world, how to go create more trouble. So do mm -hmm. not underestimate, they think you think this is going away just by, by arresting a, a, a 50 people and these people go, to, no, there's more, there's more coming. If the Hong Kong people take advantage of this situation, they will show the strength and they are the sunshine, they're the light, and that mm -hmm. will take out the viruses. Mm -hmm of the city, including these political viruses. Um, some have um, claimed that the coming um, electoral reform will sort of further compress the existing space for those um, pan-democrats in um, the last call. And I wonder what your take is on this. You know, it's up to the people. That's why I'm saying when the news media is responsible, and, and, and when you have the education right, the teachers right, then the people will go along this way. Every electoral reform in every country, somebody think they have an advantage or somebody think there's a disadvantage. Sometimes mm -hmm. it turned out not to be the case at all. So I think it's really about the Hong Kong people. Yes, I think it's interesting that they had uh, slogans, interesting slogans, I mean, uh, a full contradiction. They were calling uh, for a revolution of all times. And uh, I just <laughs> wish they, they could cross the border and just go to Shenzhen and to mainland China to see that the real revolution is happening right now in mainland China. It's just right. amazing if they only had the experience. And so the real revolution is not, is not what they were looking for. This was mm. this destruction and chaos. It was anarchy. I'm totally involved in the 2019 rioting because uh, I'm basically one of their targets. <laughs> my photos and my personal information were all online and, and, and sticking on the walls, on, on the streets and stuff like that. So I've been through that and uh, I understand fully why this reform is totally necessary. I think the national security law uh, implementation actually helps to solve that problem, but it didn't solve the core issues that people are promoting violence, people are promoting independence. We're using the system loopholes to try to enter the system. So I think that's why this re reform is very, uh, very important. So I think thank you for your time today, this morning. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, everybody.